Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another session of KDVA's webinar series about Korea defense veterans. KDVA is very thankful and proud to partner with the Second India Head Division Association on this important topic about our veterans of the Korean Demilitarized Zone or DMZ. I am Colonel Retired Steve Lee, the Senior Vice President of KDVA. I will introduce General Retired Vincent Brooks, the Chairman and President of KDVA for short opening remarks. Then our moderator, Colonel Retired Mike Devino, will lead a discussion with our panelists. He will then open the floor for Q&A with our audience members. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Please keep the questions relevant to our discussion and short. This webinar will be available on the kdva.vet or VET digital library later today. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce General Brooks, sir. Okay, Steve, thank you very much. And good morning to everyone in America. Good evening to everyone in Korea who uh, may have tuned in for this webinar today. Uh, let me welcome you to the first in a series of discussions about the demilitarized zone that separates North and South Korea. Uh, very well known around the world, symbolic in many ways, and yet very real. Uh, this demilitarized zone, or DMZ, as you will hear it referred to, is, is really the icon of the armistice that was activated in 1953. Uh, as you will hear, it, it replaced the 38th parallel as the dividing line between North and South. And it separates not only the two countries, but also, in many respects, two different worlds, starkly contrasting the modernity and prosperity of South Korea against the stagnation and poverty of North Korea. But the reality of the separation, which was designed to inhibit a resumption of war on the Korean Peninsula, is manifested in a physical standoff between highly armed opponents. The Republic of Korea and U.S. alliance, supported by United Nations Command on the south side, and the North Korean People's Armed Forces on the north side. Hundreds of thousands of combat and ambush patrols have been conducted along and within the demilitarized zone over the last 68 years, looking for and countering infiltration by the opposite side. Many lives have been lost. Many injuries have been sustained among those who serve there. But the situation along the DMZ continues to evolve. It was initially secured by US forces and it is now secured by Republic of Korea forces in every place except the Truce Village at Panmunjom. The feeling is quiet, yet tense all the time. And it, that is because the, the situation can change literally in the blink of an eye. And this is something that is well known to their, those who served on the, the DMZ during these 68 years of armistice. And it's through their eyes that we can gain an appreciation of the history and the reality of the Korean DMZ. So today we'll hear an American perspective of the DMZ. And I, I wanna thank our panelists for their services uh, rendered on the DMZ. And for joining us today to share their experiences. And we look forward to hearing from each one of you. I also want to thank KDVA's partner in all of our activities, and that's the Korea US Alliance Foundation. And also, as uh, Colonel Lee mentioned, our partner for this webinar today, the Second Indian Head Division Association, second to none. And I'm proud to be a, a part of that association as well. So thank you all for joining us today. And I will now turn it back over to Colonel Steve Lee, uh, and who will introduce our moderator and panel. Thank you. Sir, thank you very much. Please allow me to introduce our moderator, Colonel Retired Mike Devino, who served two tours in the 2nd Infantry Division in Korea from 1985 to 1987 and 1990 to 1991. He commanded frontline companies at Camp Hovey, Camp Howells, and in the DMZ. And he served as a Division Assistant Operations Officer. He also served with the 9th Infantry Division, 82nd Airborne Division, U.S. Southern Command, U.S. Central Command, and U.S. Pacific Command. He is a graduate of the U.S. 
Army War College, and his decorations include the Defense Superior Service Medal and the Legion of Merit. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Davino. Thank you, Steve, for the introduction, and more importantly, for helping to organize this webinar. As a member of both the KDVA and the 2IDA, I am really glad that these two great organizations have formed a partnership to advocate for and help the people who built this alliance and continue to support South Korea. The 2nd Infantry Division has long been associated with Korea, but its history starts in France during World War I. And my connection to the Indian Head Division started a century ago when my grandfather and favorite Irishman, Robert Rafferty, served in the 2nd Division. So with that in mind, I want to wish everybody a happy St. Patrick's Day. Since the signing of the Armistice Agreement on 27 July 53, more than 3.3 million service members have served in Korea. And of those U.S. service members, roughly a half a million of them have worn the famed Indian head patch since the division returned to Korea in 1965. The Armistice Agreement halted major combat along the DMZ, but many people do not know that hostilities across the zone persisted for many years. In today's webinar, we will cover these three main topic areas. The danger of serving on the DMZ, especially in the 60s and 70s, how the DMZ is different now, the teamwork between the Republic of Korea and United States forces along the DMZ, and observations of the Korean People's Army through the years. It's great that we are able to bring together some DMZ veterans with firsthand perspectives about their frontline missions. First, we have David Benbo, an attorney at law who served 16 months in the DMZ with the 2nd Infantry Division. He received the Imjin Scout Certificate after his first 20 missions in the zone in 1968. Mr. Benbo was one of five veterans selected by the History Channel for a documentary titled Running the DMZ and was also interviewed for a South Korean documentary called A Silent War. Mr. Benbo has personally tracked down 750 veterans who served in the DMZ and he has organized multiple reunions for DMZ veterans and their families. He was awarded a Hero of Democracy Award by the Charlotte Observer for his work to get coverage for DMZ veterans exposed to the herbicide Agent Orange. We also have First Lieutenant Creighton Hooker, who was the former platoon, uh, platoon leader in Charlie Company and a company commander in Bravo Company of the 3rd Battalion, 23rd Infantry of the 2nd ID. He ran combat patrols, commanded guard posts, and was the officer in charge of the South Barrier Fence when not on patrol or guard duty in the Z. He received the Combat Infantry Badge, Armed Forces Expeditionary Medal, and Korea Defense Service Medal. We also have Lieutenant Colonel Sean Morrow, who commanded the United Nations Command Security ba Battalion in Panmunjom. He served on the Trilateral Committee, representing the United Nations Commands in, Command in talks with South Korea and North Korea. Lieutenant Colonel Morrow was also heavily involved in over 40 direct engagements with the North Korean military, and he hosted U.S. ROC and DPRK leaders for a historic meeting in 2019. Lieutenant Colonel Morrow led a rifle platoon in the 3rd Infantry Division during the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and commanded an infantry company in Baghdad during the surge of 2007-2008. He is a West Point graduate, and he is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Chicago. So let's start with Creighton Hooker and Dave Benbo. Could you give us a sense of what brought you to Korea in the 1960s, 70s, and what the DMZ was like back then? And we'll start with Creighton. Sure. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, just to give you some background, I arrived in Korea in 1968. 
And uh, I think what caused me to go to Korea was a dramatic increase in the number of North Korean hostile actions, particularly ambushes, but also the scope, the scale of the, uh, the attacks were becoming more and more significant. Uh, the Blue House raid is a prime example, uh, the USS Pueblo capture, uh, second example, and there are others, uh, bombing of uh, US troop barracks. Uh, so the North Koreans were really getting very, very uh, active and aggressive. Um, as an infantry officer in 1968, I fully expected to be deployed to Vietnam. Um, I got a letter from the 2nd Infantry Division after I got my orders to Korea. I, I thought I'd uh, gotten very lucky because it looked like I was going to Korea rather than Vietnam. And I got a really wonderful letter from the 2nd Infantry Division saying that uh, make sure I bought my dress blues because they had a lot of social activities and uh, they had plenty of uh, uh, athletic equipment, tennis rackets and so on. But I made sure that I should have my golf clubs shipped over when I could. So I thought I really had uh, gotten lucky and was going to just have a really nice tour in uh, Korea. And so I'm, I'm processing in at the second division headquarters and I asked the NCO who was processing me in, where should I have my golf club sent? And the uh, NCO said, uh, sir, you're going to the DMZ and we had two guys killed there last week. So I didn't know what I was getting into, um, but I learned very quickly that it was anything but an easy tour. Um, the DMZ itself was really a very much a paradox for me. Uh, the fact that it was absolutely beautiful, pristine, uh, thick woods, uh, very lush vegetation, uh, streams and rivers running through it, lots and lots of wildlife. Uh, so it was actually just a beautiful, looked very peaceful from a distance, uh, but in fact, it was extremely dangerous. Um, the terrain made uh, ambushes uh, very, very uh, easy for the North Koreans to, uh, to do. Uh, there was a lot of uh, unexploded ordnance uh, from, the, the sec uh, from the Korean War st still in the zone. Uh, there were minefields, there were uh, fighting positions where we could walk up and find uh, pineapple grenades and uh, M1 ammo clips from 1953 still where they'd been left when the troops uh, departed. Um, by far and away, though, the biggest danger was the North Korean soldiers. Uh, the terrain and the dense vegetation made it very, very easy for them to, uh, to hide and to ambush uh, units. Um, they were particularly good troops in that they were experts at camouflage. And they also had developed uh, sort of hiding places, almost like spider holes, where I'm sure we walked by uh, multiple North Korean uh, units, small units, uh, and never knew they were there. They were extremely, extremely good troops. Um, they didn't really want to engage uh, American forces unless they actually had the upper hand. So we rarely uh, went out with, well, broke our units down into less than 10 men. Occasionally we'd go down to five, but uh, that was asking for trouble. Um, one of the more dangerous things actually was walking the military demarcation line. Uh, well, part of our job was occasionally to walk right down the MDL to make sure all the, uh, the markers were standing and to report any that were, uh, were down. Uh, as we'd walk along the MDL, the North Korean troops would come out of their bunkers and they'd yell at us uh, insults. I found out later from talking to the Katusas, they were often insults. Uh, telling us to go home and occasionally the North Koreans would just take a shot at us. Uh, so it was a, a pretty unpleasant time, um, but as I say, a, a major paradox. And so that's my sort of feeling about it. And I'll pass it over to David. Thanks, great. David? Thank you very much. Uh, I was sent to Korea in uh, February of 68, right after the Pueblo had been captured in the uh, Blue House raid. I finished five of my eight week advanced infantry training course at Fort Dix. And we were called together and said, boys, your training's over, you're going to Korea. Uh, a lot of the guys started high five and saying, yeah, we dodged Vietnam. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, why are we going to Korea so quickly? And I found out. I'm gonna summarize, uh, since I was a Sergeant E5, I went over there a slick sleeve private, came out of Sergeant E5, but I'm gonna summarize uh, the danger that I was 
personally aware of. Uh, July 30th, 1968, my platoon, third platoon, uh, was in a night ambush uh, patrol. Uh, firefight broke out. Mike Ramarchuk from Philadelphia was killed. Uh, Earl Jeffrey from Oklahoma was shot in the face and the chest. Cleveland Davis was shot in the foot. A Katusa named Amai S was shot in the foot. Uh, Earl was sent home and we never heard from him again. I had been on patrol with those guys at three prior patrols and that night I was in a foxhole along the barrier fence watching the uh, red and green tracers going off and hearing the booms off in the distance. It was a terrible night. Um, sometime in August, within a week or two, a Katusa was killed in the Korean DMZ and I'm very embarrassed and ashamed, but I cannot remember his name. I shared a foxhole with him uh, several weeks prior and uh, I was trying to teach him English and he was trying to teach me Korean and I just can't remember his name, uh, but uh, he was also killed in the DMZ, also third platoon. Uh, in September of uh, September 27th of 68, uh, two men signalmen uh, were doing uh, wiring uh, up to guard post Gladys, our guard post. Uh, they were ambushed in their Jeep and Joseph Kayer and Mike Reynolds were killed. In fact, uh, Creighton Hooker was uh, on patrol uh, when that happened and uh, he was the first to get to them. Uh, they were already dead. Uh, also, uh, in the, the uh, summer to fall of 68, uh, Reese Weathers was wounded. I was on OP Maisie that night and Reese was wounded in the head with a grenade uh, shrapnel. Uh, of, the, of the 16 months uh, that I was there, uh, those are the firefights uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, there were others that I was not that involved with. Uh, of course, keep in mind, we were in uh, foxholes that had been defoliated by, I later learned in 1993, Agent Orange. Guard post Gladys was void of vegetation. Uh, and then the worst loss of life uh, was uh, March the 15th uh, of uh, 1969 when B Company was out walking the the line like Creighton Hooker had just uh, said. Creighton was, by the way, Creighton was an outstanding officer. I was in his company. It was a privilege to serve with him. Uh, and uh, B Company was uh, ambushed. A, uh, a troop was killed and it, three were wounded and it took a while to get them out of the DMZ uh, because the North Koreans had the uh, firepower on them and had the advantage. Finally got them out of the DMZ. There was a medevac waiting for them. It started snowing. The three wounded were loaded into the medevac. It went up, came straight down, blew up and killed everybody. The uh, doctor, the medic, the crew members and the three wounded. Uh, so yes, the DMZ was a dangerous place. Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> when I served in the DMZ in 1987, things were much more routine. Of the 42nd Division soldiers that uh, were killed since the armistice, 39 of them were killed during a period uh, of the late 60s when Crate and Dave were there. Uh, at the time they were there, the 2nd Division sector of the DMZ was 18 miles long. And to guard that, that portion of the DMZ, the, the division had an entire regimental combat team of from the rock army attached to it who are under the operational control of it as well as uh, a brigade headquarters from the u.s seventh division and a rotating infantry battalion from the seventh division that rotated up every four months or so by the time i got there the division had a sector of less than one mile and that was guarded by one of the five infantry battalions in the 2ID at that time. Each battalion rotated up to the DMZ for about a 10 week period uh, to perform uh, DMZ duty. One rifle company of the battalion normally manned two platoon strength guard posts as well as some sm smaller posts along the South Barrier fence. Another rifle company served as a quick reaction force and a third rifle company uh, conducted uh, ambush and reconnaissance patrols, as uh, General Brooks mentioned earlier. 
the heavy mortar company, the combat support company, uh, was occupied a small fire base inside Camp Liberty Bell, which was a, right next to the DMZ. And the scout platoon and anti-tank platoons conducted mounted and dismounted patrols. Uh, during the 10 weeks on the DMZ, my company conducted about 180 patrols, recons, ambushes, and mounted patrols. There were no firefights or enter, enemy contact. Uh, next, uh, to get a more recent perspective, Sean Morrow, we just heard how confrontational the DMZ was along the front lines back in the 60s. You took command of the Joint Security Area United Nations Command Security Battalion in the summer of 2018 under much different circumstances. There was the historic North-South Summit in the JSA in April 2018, so there was a sense of engagement. What can you tell us about this environment of engagement and working with the North Koreans in Panmunjom? Thank you, sir. Um, and thanks, General Brooks, and thanks to all the folks that are listening in from Korea and from the United States. It's really great to be back with my brothers and sisters who are vets of the peninsula. Well, sir, in 2017 is when I found out I was going uh, to take command in Panmunjom, and a very senior army leader uh, told me, hey, Sean, make sure you are mentally prepared to go to war, uh, because that was the environment in 2017. Uh, I was extraordinarily tense. Uh, in November of 2017, there was a defection by a North Korean soldier in Panmunjom. This is about six months before I arrived. Um, but there was a, a gunfight. Uh, North Koreans shot their comrade as he crossed the border. And he was rescued by uh, UNC soldiers from United Nations Command. The soldiers on the DMZ did not engage the North Koreans. And I think that that was a critical decision by privates and sergeants and the leadership uh, in Panmunjom back then before I arrived. Because had there been an all out fight uh, and we had dead soldiers on both sides, I'm not sure that what would have happened over the ensuing months actually would have occurred because much to everyone's surprise, uh, Chairman Kim on New Year's Eve of that year going into 2018, changed his tone a little bit in his New Year's message to his nation. Uh, and only a few, a few weeks after that, the North Koreans were participating in the Olympics. USFK and United Nations Command working with the Korean government uh, leveraged these moments. Uh, and in April, there was the historic summit between President Moon and Chairman Kim. So as I was preparing to take command in June of 2018, it was clear that there was a, there was a change in the air. Uh, and I was coming into something much different than what I had been told to prepare for. That summer of 2018, uh, President Trump and Chairman Kim also had a historic summit. And in that, they made some agreements. Uh, the, the first and possibly one of the most powerful moments I've been involved in in, in my career was a repatriation of several, uh, several remains from North Korea of U.S. and Korean soldiers. Uh, and that happened in August of 2018, July and August of 2018 were those missions to bring those soldiers home. In September, uh, President Moon and Chairman Kim uh, signed a comprehensive military agreement. United Nations Command uh, was able to support this agreement because it, it largely led towards many of the goals that United Nations Command have. And in the history of Panmunjom, uh, since 1976, since Arthur Boniface was killed and Mark Barrett, uh, there had not been a lot of engagement between the security battalion of United Nations Command and the North Korean security battalion. The, the the security battalion, the US security battalion, my troops typically secured UNC uh, senior leaders, diplomats from the US embassy, Korean diplomats, uh, but we did not participate. Uh, our, job, our job was mainly security. But as we were given a seat at the table, the UNC was given a seat at the table in September of 2018, uh, General Brooks and his staff decided that uh, the, the security battalion was there every day on the ground. And perhaps there was a place for our team to be a little more involved than just securing the operations. And it was a great and empowering decision for us because that started a tremendous amount of interpersonal engagement between the two security battalions. Uh, over the course of the next, uh, the next three months, I personally was able to have about 40 interactions, prolonged interactions, uh, hours at a time 
with our North Korean counterparts uh, while supporting the work of UNC and UNCMAC and the Korean, Korean Army. Uh, I think the next question uh, I'll hold off, sir, uh, because I think that gets a little more into uh, what the interactions were like, but that just speaks a lot to the shift that happened in 2017, 2018, why it happened. Um, and for all those listening, that doesn't happen without nearly 70 years of, of standing ready and making sure things didn't get worse. Um, so it was, it was a long journey and we still have a long way to go, but uh, 2017 and 2018 was pretty amazing. Thanks, Sean. Good rundown. Next, we'd, as, as you mentioned, we'd like to uh, go into the relationship with the Iraq counter, your Korean counterparts. So we'll start with uh, Dave, then Crate, and then Sean. Certainly. Um, my uh, relationship was limited to the uh, roughly 12 Catoosas that were in Charlie Company. Uh, the Catoosas were, uh, for the most part, outstanding soldiers, uh, but they were like the GI enlisted men. They were some better than others. Um, I will say that they did everything that we did, uh, and I enjoyed my relationship uh, with the Catoosa soldiers. Uh, I did have a problem on two occasions with the language uh, barrier, and I'm not saying it was the Catoosa's fault uh, any more than it was my fault, uh, but the, the language uh, barrier uh, on one night, and I didn't even tell you about the night the uh, North Korean tried to dig under the barrier fence while I was in the mini tower with the Catoosa, uh, but the, uh, we fired on the at the sound, and the uh, at any rate, eventually the quick reaction force came and pulled a sweep on the north side of the fence. And, and I take full blame for this. I did not explain to the Katusa uh, well enough that it was uh, GIs and he opened fire on the quick reaction force. I was able to uh, disarm him real quickly, but uh, uh, at any rate, uh, that was a problem that I had and I created myself, but luckily no one was uh, a hit on the quick reaction force and we did not find a body the next day uh, but we did find a hole halfway under the fence uh, on the north side but he did not get through thanks dave great yeah um thanks i'd like to just touch real quickly on something that sean said that uh, about the uh, relationship with uh, north koreans up at uh, pan moon john uh, that's a wonderful thing for me to hear. Um, they absolutely hated us in 1968. Uh, I had an opportunity to get to Pan Munjan uh, when I first arrived uh, with the uh, 3rd of the 23rd, and they forewarned me when we went into Pan Munjan that if they grab you and try and drag you into the building, you better fight like crazy because you're gone if they get you inside that building. And they, the hate in their eyes when I would walk by a North Korean soldier back then was really frightening. So that's just one I want to say I'm happy to hear that things seem to be getting better. So much like David, uh, my experience with the Katusas was excellent. Uh, I thought they were, for the most part, really, really good soldiers. They were invaluable to me, uh, translating the propaganda that was coming over the speakers in the DMZ uh, at night. Uh, North Korea would, would broadcast over these big loudspeakers, and I didn't have a clue what they were saying in Korean, but uh, the Katusas could, uh, could translate and uh, just made my job a lot easier and knew what, sort of what was going on. Uh, I thought they were mostly hardworking, dedicated soldiers. Uh, they were anxious to please. I never heard a Katusa complain, complain in my 13 months over there. And as platoon leader and a company commander, I never had a, had a single Katusa discipline issue. So I thought they were really outstanding. Uh, also, I'd just like to uh, shout out to um, how well I thought we were treated by the villagers uh, in South Korea. When we'd go on winter exercises like an ORT or some kind of a training exercise and we'd take a break and be, the, the column would be in a village somewhere, uh, Oftentimes, the villagers would come out with pots of hot coals and just walk along the columns and let guys warm up just a little bit because we all know how cold those Korean winters were. 
Uh, so I, anyway, I just thought the relationship and the support that the Katusas as well as the South Korean villagers gave us was exceptional. Um, my senior officers, officers had always emphasized that we were visitors in Korea and we should act accordingly. I thought that was very, very sound advice and I tried to pass that same philosophy along to my troops. And we had actually company classes at the time where we try and reinforce to um, the soldiers and the companies uh, how we were supposed to behave uh, to our Korean hosts. Um, one area I think I, I'd like to touch on, I think I should have done a little bit better in was I wasn't familiar with the officer ratings and the insignia on North Korea or South Korean uh, officers uniforms. And I had one rather embarrassing moment uh, when I bumped into a uh, South Korean officer who'd come to our company area. And I, I didn't know whether I should initiate a salute because I couldn't recognize his insignia. And I was always a little bit embarrassed that he, he never said anything, but I was kind of embarrassed that I didn't know whether I should initiate a salute and I didn't want to disrespect him. So that's my experience with uh, South Korean military. Thanks, great. Sean? Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm gonna keep my answer short here, sir, because I really wanna make sure we can get to question four. Uh, but I, my experience with my counterparts in Panmunjom uh, could not have been better. Uh, and I say that because I think it was built on mutual respect. United Nations Command has the clear legal military authority uh, in Panmunjom, but our presence there is small relative uh, to the Rock Army. And they're no longer Katusas uh, in Panmunjom in the JSA. It's an independent Rock Army Battalion. Uh, so we had the authority, but they had the strength. Uh, and I think we both recognize that. And we recognize that things were changing fast in Panmunjom on the north side, and we had to work together. Uh, so I, I would describe my relationship with, with Colonel Lee Eugene and Colonel Che Jin Young uh, as brothers. Uh, I would do anything for them. Uh, I felt like they were ultimately loyal to the mission and UNC while also being perfectly loyal to their nation. They were in a tough spot uh, with, with two real bosses and they did a fantastic job and I'm so grateful for that opportunity. Thanks, Sean. Um, I had extensive uh, contact with uh, our rock counterparts over the years that I served in Korea. And, but one anecdote I'd like to, shortly after I arrived in Korea, about three days after I arrived in Korea, there was a command post exercise uh, going to, that was ready to start. And they needed a liaison officer from the 2nd Infantry Division, US, to the 7th Rock Corps, which at that time was the Counteroffensive Corps. So with my three days of experience with the 2nd Division, I was tagged to be the liaison officer. <laughs> went trucked out to the Rock 7th Corps headquarters, went down into a bunker with 20 Korean officers all around the telephones. I learned my first first word in Korean, Yobazeo. <laughs> and from there, uh, we got right into the exercise. Uh, then it became time to, uh, to go to Chow. And we went down to the uh, Korean officers mess hall and started to eat. And they, one of, one of my rock counterparts asked me, Davino, uh, how long have you been in Korea? I said, oh, about four days. And he said, how, uh, how do you know how to use chopsticks? And, you know, stupid me, the army really didn't do a good job of preparing us. I said, well, I learned when I was in Japan. And all of a sudden, you know, I had no, no, real idea about the long history between Japan and Korea. And they asked me, you know, how, how did I said, oh, yeah, how, how did you like Japan? And I, I said, oh, it was really nice. People were very friendly over there. And from the for the rest of the exercise, there was a little bit of tension between uh, between me and my rock counterparts. But uh, over the years, I grew to respect the rock army and uh, really had a great, great relationship. Uh, with any, to include serving as the division's liaison officer to the 79th uh, Rock Army Infantry Regiment, 
uh, during Team Spirit 86. Uh, now, uh, we'll move to a question about the North Korean military. Uh, what did you observe about the KPA threat and the Korean People's Army troop behavior? Uh, we'll start with Sean, then go to Crate, and then to Dave. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Uh, first of all, it's, I think it's really important to note that what I'm about to say will sound positive, but doesn't really change anything about the strategic threat that North Korea poses to South Korea, to the United States. So I'm talking very tactical here. Um, when we started our engagements with the North Koreans, uh, it felt a lot like what Crate said back in the day. There seemed to be distrust, dislike, uh, and probably even a little bit of hate. And every engagement went off of a script. Uh, the, they would not go off the script. They read what they were told to read. Every engagement was audio recorded, oftentimes video recorded. Uh, basically, I think they were feeling it out. It was a lot of the same old business. But the more, like in any human interactions, the more we, time we spent together, the more we started to be able to relax and to talk about things that weren't just on the script. Um, when we removed the weapons from Panmunjom, and if you, if you don't realize that that happened, that happened in the, in the fall of 2018, there are no guns anymore in Panmunjom, no heavy weapons, no pistols. Everyone is unarmed on both sides. And as a trust building measure, uh, we inspected both sides. And on that day was when I felt there was a real breakthrough uh, because we talked about the history. We talked about Barrett Boniface. We talked about memorials. We talked about how we remember the, f the past and the fighting. Uh, and at one point uh, we were on the North Korean side uh, in a very stark banquet room with photos of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il on the walls. And a North Korean Colonel came over and offered me a cigarette. And I'm not a smoker, but I also realized I couldn't pass up this opportunity. Uh, so I accepted and we sat on a couch together and smoked a cigarette. And in some broken English, he said, Mauro, do you know what I dream about? I dream about Johnny Walker and Marlboro Reds. <laughs> and in that moment, I just felt a real strong connection just between two soldiers uh, and a remote outpost. Uh, and the engagements continued like this, but there's some amazing observations that we were able to have as well. Um, General Brooks opened the door to these engagements. And then on General Abrams' first day in command, his first trip was to Pamun Jam, where he gave the similar guidance. And he said, I want you to have as much commander to commander interaction as you possibly can, because that's how you de-escalate a situation. If you guys aren't talking to each other, you can't de-escalate, but I need you talking to each other. And so we pushed that issue. And what we realized one day on the North Korean side, uh, we were doing a little work, uh, actually demining together, North Koreans, South Koreans, and United States soldiers demining together in North Korea. And, and in that moment, uh, I, I mentioned just making small talk that President Bush had passed away. And a North Korean colonel through an interpreter said, oh, really, like, what happened? I said, well, I'll show you pictures. And I opened the internet and his eyes got really wide. And he said, is that the internet? Oh, I said, yes, God. it is. And he said, well, can you ask the internet what world leaders were there. And so we told them and they furiously start scribbling this down in a notebook. And that's when we realized that, yes, there's a small percentage of elites in Pyongyang that have access to the global internet, but most of these troops didn't and even these senior officers didn't. And so we now had information that they didn't have. And we we're able to use that uh, in the, all of our ensuing engagements. For example, we showed them live feeds from the NASA Mars Rover. And if you can imagine and remember, or even if you live through the US landing on the moon and families just crowded around televisions watching in amazement. That's what we had. We had, we had our iPhone and we had North Koreans surrounding us watching these videos of Mars rovers and looking at the sky and saying, is that that? And we say, yes. Um, and just this access to information, it just helped break down the barriers between us. Uh, at one point though, we, re we recognized that no matter how good it was moving, no matter how much we wished each other's families well, that there was a difference. And let me explain the difference between my time in Iraq and Afghanistan and my time here. When we dealt in Iraq and Afghanistan with people who were siding with insurgents, in private moments, you could find the cracks, that they weren't true believers, uh, that they were doing this for survival. I never found the crack in the loyalty of the North Koreans. Their interpersonal relationships became warm, 
even at times kind, but they never ever even hinted that their leader was wrong, that their system was not the system they wanted to be a part of, that they weren't the greatest nation on earth. There were no cracks. They are either scared or they are true believers. And I think that that's an important reminder that we still have a lot of work to do. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Creighton? Uh, the, um, they're really the threat that the North Koreans um, uh, possessed at the, at the time, 1968. The most significant threat was an outright invasion of the North into the South. Uh, our unit uh, straddled what they used to call the bowling alley, which I guess it's traditional uh, invasion route from north to south. And so the, the, the big um, mission was if that happened, we were to engage the enemy, try and make them deploy and just delay them so that the bridges over the engine river could be blown. They were mined. And if they were blown, then we would do the best we could to uh, escape and evade back across the river and join up with our troops. So that was one of the major uh, threats that we had to deal with. But the more common threat was really the small unit engagements uh, where we were trying to stop infiltrators or exfiltrators and just dealing with uh, North Korean reconnaissance patrols and combat patrols that they sent through the DMZ. Uh, there were a lot of North Korean snipers. It was rarely reported. I mean, we would report it back to the company, but whether, how, where it went from there, I don't know, because I couldn't find a single uh, incident in any report up higher in the chain of command where sniping was noted. Um, there are a lot of ambushes from both sides. Uh, North Korean uh, like to instigate uh, firefights between the guard posts. Uh, they had fire superiority, bigger bigger weapons than we did. Uh, so they would occasionally open up on uh, GP Gladys or, or Jane or uh, then there were some, several pretty good firefights. Uh, North Koreans would also come across and uh, uh, put mines in. So we had to be careful about those. As far as troop behavior goes, I thought the North Korean troops were very well trained, highly motivated. And as I said before, they didn't like us at all. Uh, they excelled in small unit tactics. Uh, they were excellent in camouflage and setting up hasty ambushes. Uh, mostly they chose when and where to fight, which I thought was one of the really frustrating things. Um, they liked to use the element of surprise. Uh, they made sure they had fire superiority and they generally wanted to have, be, uh, have superior numbers. Um, I think the North Korean uh, guard posts uh, occasionally, or not occasionally, but regularly monitor where the uh, US patrols were. They, with binoculars and field scopes, could check out the general area where we were. And that left the uh, North Koreans opportunity to sneak across in a part of, the, of our area of operations where we weren't. Um, I think the North Korean guard posts also use radio contact to just basically tell them where we were and uh, avoid our, our ambushes, except occasionally they'd bump into one of them. Uh, they were a formidable enemy. Um, say they, uh, they were tough. Thanks, great. Dave? Uh, the rules of engagement that we had said that if, there were, if you saw an, an individual in the DMZ it was not one of ours. And if that individual was not obviously uh, trying to uh, surrender or defect, we were to shoot him. Uh, and so that's where I start. Uh, the North Korean soldiers uh, were good soldiers and I uh, had a healthy respect for them. I knew that if they got the chance, they would kill me. And I knew that I was supposed to kill them if I got the chance. Uh, I recently wrote uh, a David Letterman uh, type list of the 10 scaredest times I'd ever been in my life. And it seems that all 10 of them were in Korea. The last, the ninth and 10th were in the daytime and the other eight were all at night. Uh, so at night in the DMZ, it's totally black. It's dark, you can't see a thing. So you have you get to where you can rely on your, certainly your hearing, but also your sense of smell. Along those lines, I learned 
that when the night bird whistles got really uh, loud and really uh, numerous, to beware. And I, I felt like that that was the North Korean soldiers uh, signaling and later confirmed that in a book by Joseph Bermudez, who wrote a book about North Korean commandos. Uh, another thing that was interesting, I learned that I could uh, smell the North Korean soldiers. Uh, I'm sure they could smell us and all of our bug repellent that we put on, uh, but I learned that I could smell them. And when the night bird whistles were numerous and when that kind of garlicky smell uh, was around, uh, I knew to be really, really uh, careful. And then all of a sudden the insects would get quiet and I knew that we, we really had a problem. So I didn't have any interaction with the North Korean soldiers other than what I just described. Thanks, David. I, I just want to give, a, give my perspective a little bit in, in, in a different way. We, we did not have any contact uh, during the time I was on the DMZ with, uh, with the enemy forces. As I mentioned, we ran over 180 patrols uh, in my company alone without any contact. However, one way that the North Koreans uh, and ev everybody, I'm sure everybody will think of it, will, is familiar with this, is that they excellent with propaganda. I mean, we were get, we would get leafleted on a on a daily basis, and one specific uh, incident was when the First Battalion, 23rd Infantry, had the DMZ mission in 1986. They had one of their Katusas defect to North Korea. And that caused quite, as, as you can imagine, that caused quite a stir. Uh, but we were just getting inundated with uh, leaflets. And uh, I picked up one of the leaflets and I asked my senior Katusa, uh, Sergeant Park, please uh, translate this for me. And it was, you know, it was a picture of, of the Katusa and his, all his equipment laid out on, like we used to call a junk on the bunk uh, field inspection. And I asked, what's going on here with this? And he said, the KPA is asking for other Katusas to defect. And when they come, they want them to bring all their equipment. And they're especially interested in Singars, frequency hopping radio, and a set of night vision goggles. Wow. And I said, oh. And I thought that was pretty sophisticated. And when I came back to, Korea. Three years later, I picked up uh, I picked up another leaflet that was on our camp, and I looked at it, and it was that same Katusa, but it's it was three it was three years later, and it had a picture. And I again I asked asked my senior Katusa, you know, to translate it. He said, "Well, that uh, that was a Katusa that defected, and now he's married, and he's and this is his, his son hundredth day birthday." And had a nice picture of him and his family, and they're still asking the uh, Katusa soldiers, targeting the Katusa soldiers. And I thought that was that was pretty good. You know, the, they were very sophisticated with it. Even you know later when I was stationed at Fort Bragg and worked with the psyops folks, uh, you know, it was on the same par uh, of the quality of work they did for the uh, psychological operations. So. That was uh, what I wanted to say about contact with the North Koreans. Uh, now, uh, panelists will take some questions from the audience. I got one question here where this fellow was a fire support, uh, uh, a field artillery man, and he was stationed at Fire Base 4 Papa 1 in 1980. And uh, for, our, our, for Dave and Crate, uh, did you have... Uh, did you did you plan artillery support for the uh, for the patrols you were on? Did you have forward observers with you? Uh, do you want me to go first or David? Yes, uh, you, you answer it, LT. Okay. So um, we did have uh, a forward artillery forward observer on guard post Gladys for a while, uh, but we didn't have any with us uh, on the patrols. Uh, one of the sort of sad stories I have was that when that uh, Bravo Company uh, work party was ambushed uh, in 1969, where the helicopter went down, was that when they were pinned down in that rice paddy, um, uh, there was a call for indirect fire. 
to because they were pinned down under heavy machine gun fire and the initial burst of fire had killed one guy and wounded three and it was about two o'clock in the afternoon when that happened so it was cold it was march as i recall and it started to snow so we wanted to get these guys out of there so we asked for I wasn't me but I understand that artillery support was called for called on and it was denied because the uh, the political situation so the second request was how about just put smoke on the north korean position and forget the he but let's put smoke on it so at least we get these guys out and the answer was sorry and so those guys laid out in a rice paddy for fortunately sergeant mckinney was able to get them to move up from one position to another because the uh, North Korean soldiers came down and threw grenades into the position they were initially pinned down in. Um, but to, again, to shorten the story, um, we had to wait till about seven o'clock at night till it turned dark to get the wounded out and the dead. And uh, we just never got any uh, indirect fire. Thanks, Crete. And I'll just add something to four Papa one. Now, 4 Papa 1 at the time, by 1987, was no longer used as a fire base. Uh, the battalion that rotated for 10 weeks for DMZ duty used to have their battalion tactical operations center set up on 4 Papa 1 in the bunkers that, that used to be used uh, to house uh, that ar field artillery battery. In 1986 or 87, when the divisions upgraded from 105 millimeter howitzers to 155, they opened up a fire base further south on the other side of the Amgen River called Four Papa Three. And those, uh, they would have, a, you know, they would call it a hot gun and it would literally uh, follow the patrols out on the, on the DMZ uh, that were in the DMZ at the time. And the same thing with my heavy mortar, mortar platoon. We also had one, one gun man 24 seven uh, following them. But uh, the rules of engagement were very strict. To be able to use indirect fire would have required uh, the personal approval of the division commander back in 1987. So, so that's, uh, let's see, we got, uh, got one other question from the, uh, from the chat, but I don't see it here anymore. Let me see. Oh, okay. Uh, this is from, uh, and, that, and that previous question was from Brian Smith. This was from uh, Carmelo Rodriguez of the 2ID Association. How has the DMZ becoming a tourist attraction affected the DMZ mission? There are civilians everywhere. Anybody want to take that one on? Sean? Sure, sir, I, I can take on that question. It's a, it's a good one. Uh, first of all, I'd say that it's important to remember that even though I said that the weapons are out of Panmunjom, they're not out of the DMZ. So we've demilitarized the joint security area, but even the JSA battalion is still conducting armed combat patrols all around the JSA and 1st Rock Infantry Division and um, all the rest of the rock units on the front line are all conducting combat patrols. The civilian visitors to Panmunjom, that program has been going on since the early 70s and not much changes. Uh, there, is a, there is actually a, um, a chance that the tour will actually be allowed to cross more into North Korea uh, and the North Koreans will actually be allowed to cross into South Korea within the JSA, but that hasn't happened yet. Uh, I will tell you that I don't think having the visitors is causing any problems with the combat readiness of the front line uh, I don't think we, we've been very clear. Um, UNC has been very clear of making sure that those select locations are kind of in and out or they follow a, a DMZ peace trail that doesn't go near any active guard posts or any type of patrol route. So, so I think it's, uh, it gives people a taste of the DMZ, but we are not letting civilians run wild across the DMZ. Hey, Mike, Mike I might, might add one thing. If, oh, pardon me, Steve, go ahead. Um, so, uh, the perception that civilians are um, uh, all over the DMZ, uh, incorrect. Uh, the um, South Korean military, along with the United Nations Command, operate a education and training program to help 
of civilians understand the DMZ and the uh, South Korean and the uh, UNC military's mission there. And so there are several locations uh, throughout the DMZ where they can go, but you know, civilians are not all over the DMZ, certainly not. So I just want to make sure that was a clarification on that. I'm sorry, Craig. Well, I was just going to say one kind of interesting thing about the, uh, the, the tourist areas now is that the train, that rusted train that they have uh, on display, I guess, uh, in the tourist location uh, was in uh, David's and my uh, AO. We used to walk by it all the time. I had an interesting uh, experience when the History Channel flew me back in 2003 for the filming of the documentary running the DMZ. And we, we got to go to the Bridge of No Return to uh, film uh, three of the uh, fellows that were involved in the, uh, the axe murder incident. And uh, I can tell you, I was very nervous walking down with a, a cameraman, a producer, uh, a captain with a nine millimeter pistol and these three other vets because I didn't have a rifle. I didn't have my buddies with me and I couldn't run fast. And it was the same bird sounds, it was the same smells, it was the same whistles, and those doggone North Korean propaganda speakers were blasting at me, and I was uncomfortable the whole time I was down there. Thanks, Dave. We had one other, uh, one of, this has been a pretty Army-centric discussion. We had somebody ask a question uh, about uh, contact with uh, the Air Force. And uh, specifically, we, we had, you know, in the division headquarters, of course, we had uh, an Air Force liaison officer. His name was Jimmy Doolittle, and uh, he was he was the grandson of the Jimmy Doolittle. Uh, like his uh, like his grandfather, he was a pilot. And uh, also at the brigade level, we had uh, brigade we had Air Force uh, liaisons. Uh, any other uh, any other comments on that? Did you have uh, good? There was a good rundown on the artillery support available in the '60s. Did you have uh, close air support? Not that I was aware of. It. No. Okay. Let's see. Okay, we get a question. Uh, thank you for your service. I was stationed in Yangsan from February 92 to 96. Uh, the DPRK threatened the peninsula by leaving the nuclear uh, proliferation treaty when he first arrived. What is the current threat of, the, of nuclear on the, on the peninsula? It's a little beyond the DMZ scope, but do we have any, any feedback on that? Probably not. Uh, or more down at the tactical level. And at the, uh, now, interestingly, during the time Dave and Crate were over there, uh, the second division was a nuclear capable force. Mm -hmm. had the Honest John rocket, which uh, was a tactical uh, nuclear weapon. And there were, there were, uh, MSAs that the infantry battalions, maximum security areas, and you can imagine what was uh, what was stored in those maximum security areas. That infantry battalions were typically uh, were typically tasked to guard on a rotational basis. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, that all ended uh, when the army when the ar when the army lost its uh, its nuclear weapons uh, over about thirty years ago. Um, got another question. Did anyone use minesweepers while on, on patrol? In 1977, we didn't have any in the 1st Battalion, 17th Infantry. Um, the assistant division commander uh, was, uh, was upset about that. Um, but uh, just uh, for does anybody remember using minesweepers? Now, in in my company, we typically did we typically did uh, road sweeps, like if we were going to escort somebody up to the guard posts or to Panmunjom, a VIP, 
Uh, we checked out, uh, check, we had our mobile patrols check out uh, the roadway and, and use mine, mine detectors. And with that, um, we're gonna have to, we're running out of time. Great discussion and we're gonna have to, but we're gonna have to wrap up. Um, so, in future webinars about the DMZ veterans, we will have a session that focuses on the South Korean perspective of man um, to the guard posts inside the DMZ and along the demarcation line. We rarely hear about those experiences. Um, also in 2001, we'll start a, a new series called the Defense and Diplomacy Dialogue. I'd like to turn it over to Steve. Okay, well, thank you um, all panelists and moderator. Really appreciate the uh, great discussion. Again, I think the things that were discussed here today are things you, you won't find quite honestly even in history books. Um, and so what you, your insights, uh, firsthand accounts, just invaluable information and must never be lost to time. And so thank you very much for that. A little bit further on the uh, 3D series, it's intended to bring together senior leaders and experts to discuss how the Rock US Alliance needs to work together in both defense and diplomacy uh, to make the alliance better and to better engage North Korea and our panelists and a moderator talked about the need to do that kind of thing here, uh, both from the tactical level that, that connects directly to uh, defense and diplomacy. Um, if you would like to add your voice in supporting this alliance, please consider joining uh, KDVA and the uh, uh, Second Indian Head uh, Division Association. Uh, at least for KDVA, it is free and only takes a few minutes at kdva.vet. And so thank you everybody very much. And we'll look yeah. forward to more later on. Thanks, thank Steve. You. I just want to add one other thing that we discussed, uh, we discussed the soldiers, uh, about 40 soldiers who were killed on the DMZ from second division and the, uh, the second division association, we, our, our monument currently recognizes the fallen warriors from World War I, World War II and the Korean War. And we're modifying the monument to add both the deaths during the DMZ as well as uh, from the global war on terrorism. So please visit our website, 2IDA.org for more information on that. And I was uh, really honored to be a part of this. And I wanna also thank Dave, Crate and Sean for their input. Uh, Steve, and thanks once again for setting this up. Back to you. Okay, again, thank you, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you, and again, it'll be available on, this recording will be available on the KDVA digital library later on today, so thank you very much, everybody.